was born in Louisiana. It was a preacher from that state, another one there. And so he can handle all that, and I'm appreciative of him, and I hope that speaks our hearts. You know, the last few weeks we have began the series called The I Am's of Jesus. If you read the Gospel of John, there are about eight or nine of them, depending on how you count them. And as we look at the words of last week and back to that, the Bible tells us clearly that when Jesus says, I am, what he means is the same thing that Jehovah meant in the book of Exodus chapter 3 when he says, I am has sent you, Moses. Jesus is God in the flesh. And I learned Pastor Matt Smythe and we're trying to get all that worked out and his ears are different than mine and uh, I've got to get all that adjusted. So y'all just bear with us a little bit as we work through these things. But I would just want you to focus back on the text that Pastor Matt gave us last week and he discussed the fact that Jesus is the great I am. And eight or nine times in scripture, Jesus uses the phrase I am, and he says something about who he is when he uses that phrase. And from now and the next few weeks all the way to Easter, we're going to be talking about these great I am's. And so whether it's on the board or not, I want you to open with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 6. I'll start reading in verse 1 and we'll work our way to verse 6. Let me just say to those of you who are visiting for the very first time, thank you so much for coming with us. Thank you for risking your life to come out and hear me preach this morning. I really do appreciate that. When you leave, uh, at no cost to you, you'll get one squirt of hand sanitizer and a roll of toilet paper uh, as your personal gift for coming this morning. I'm just teasing a little bit about that. We are glad that you're here. I know you have a lot of choices when it comes to worship, and I hope that you'll enjoy worshiping with us this morning. John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. If you've ever been in a funeral, you've heard this passage of Scripture read because it talks about heaven. And we like to hear about heaven, especially in times of sorrow. But he starts off the passage with these words, which are so appropriate for us this morning. Let not your heart be troubled. Now, please understand what the disciples are dealing with. They left everything they had to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus was supposed to come as the Messiah to set up his kingdom. And it's easy to leave your job as a fisherman to go be the vice president in the new kingdom, wouldn't it be? Absolutely. And the disciples left on that premise. You say, Brother Dusty, I don't think so. I think they just loved Jesus. And so they just followed him because it was just rooted in love. Well, let me ask you something. How come all through the Gospels they're always arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the new kingdom? And why did one of them's mama come and ask Jesus, hey, when you come into your kingdom, can my boy sit on the right hand and on the left hand of your throne? Shame on James and John for sending their mama to ask them, Jesus that question. But it just shows what they were looking for. They were looking for an earthly kingdom. But if you'll turn back from John 14 to about chapter 12, you'll find out why their hearts are troubled. Because he sat them down and he said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And all their ears perked up to die. And Peter said, not so, Lord. You're not doing that. And Jesus tells Peter, get you behind me, Satan, because you don't even begin to understand the things of God. I did not come for an earthly kingdom. I came for a spiritual kingdom. And when he told them they were going to die, their, he was going to die, their hearts were troubled. And then they sat down in John chapter 12. And Jesus washed all of their feet. And then they came to what we call the Last Supper. And Jesus says... The one that I give this piece of bread to is going to betray me. And he dips it, and he hands it to Judas. And all the disciples look at Judas. And Jesus looks at Judas and says, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. And the Bible says Judas got up, and he went out to betray the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. 
And all of the disciples were amazed. And they still didn't suspect Judas because they looked at each other and said, who's going to betray him? Is it me? Ask Jesus. Am I the one that's going to betray him? They didn't expect Judas at all. And then as they're walking toward the garden at the very end of chapter 13, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Peter, I know you think you're going to go all the way with me, but before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. Well, let me tell you something. If you'd left all to follow Jesus and he tells you he's going to die, and one of your best friends is going to betray him, and you're going to deny the Lord three times, your heart would be troubled. And Jesus tells them, don't let your heart be troubled. Now, while we're not in this text chronologically, it certainly applies to us this morning. Are there reasons to be troubled? This is the deadest crowd I have ever preached to. Are there reasons to be troubled? Oh, there are reasons everywhere to be troubled. You have problems in your own family. You have problems in your state. There are problems in our nation. Coronavirus is all over the world. We don't know where things are going. It's the middle of election year. Just turn on the radio, and it's trouble, trouble, trouble. And we don't even have the diversion of sports to get our mind off of it because all they're showing is reruns on TV of stuff we've already seen. It's just trouble, trouble, trouble. And Jesus says this morning, don't let your heart be troubled. There are lots of reasons to be troubled, but we are the only people who have a right not to be troubled. I'm not minimizing what you're going through. I'm not minimizing the seriousness of the coronavirus. I'm not minimizing the fact that it's hard to buy groceries and I don't know what the future holds and it might get worse before it gets better. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm just saying because we know the great I am, our hearts don't need to be troubled. Jesus is the cure for heart trouble. He's the fixer of these things. In fact, if you'll read in John chapter number 11, when Jesus stands at Lazarus' tomb, the Bible says his heart was troubled. And then in chapter 13, he says his heart was troubled. Why was Jesus' heart troubled? And he tells us not to be troubled. Oh, get it. His heart was troubled, so yours doesn't have to be troubled. He carried the burden, so you don't have to carry it. He took the trouble in himself, so you can live trouble-free. And I don't mean that you don't have problems. I just mean that on the inside of your heart is not anxiety and frustration and fear, because God's not giving us that spirit. He's given us the spirit of love and of a sound mind and peace that passes all understanding. And the world is looking for individuals who have something other than what they have. They find it in us, and we find it in the Jesus who is the great I am. In chapter 6, I mean, verse 6, chapter 14, Jesus makes the great statement. And if you've been to Sunday school for one day in your life, you've heard this verse before. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And for most of my life, I read that verse without ever understanding the context. But the context is, is that he's answering two questions. One's a question, one's a request. He's answering in response to one and preemptively answering the other. The first comes from Thomas. Thomas is that guy. You know who Thomas is? Yeah, we always say he's the doubter. But it was more than just his doubting personality. Thomas had a melancholy attitude about his life. How many of you have ever watched Winnie the Pooh? You know who Eeyore is? Thomas. Thomas. That's who he is. Some of y'all have that personality. It's over. It was good while it lasted. Woe is me. Yeah. We have to fight that sometimes, don't we? In fact, in John chapter 11, where Jesus said, let's go heal Lazarus, Thomas said, let's go die with him. Come on. Let's just go do it. That's Thomas's attitude. And Thomas had this question. Lord, we don't know where you're going. And if we don't know where you're going, how do we know the way? Jesus had just told him where he was going. I go to prepare a place for you. He said, I don't know where that is. He said, if I don't know where it is, how do I know how to get there? Thomas had some heart trouble about how to get to heaven. He wanted to go to the Father's house, but he didn't know where it was and didn't know how to get there. And while many of us in this room would never voice that ourselves, we also had that same kind of heart trouble. We don't understand things. Where is Jesus? Where is he going? How do I get there? And so Jesus gives us this response. Thomas, you don't know the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Now when Jesus tells Thomas that he is the way to heaven, what does he mean by that? Well, he just means simply this. If you want to go to heaven, Jesus is the way. It is the direction of how to get to heaven. He makes it plain and clear. If you want to go to heaven, you got to go through 
Jesus. Now, if I asked you this morning, how do I get to Columbia? What would you tell me? Talk to me. I-77. Some of y'all would say, no, go, go down 321, Brother Dusty. Yeah, it's 55 miles an hour down 321. I'm going to go down 77 so I can do 77. Yeah. I like 85, too. 95, though, is my favorite interstate. Yeah. Go down 77. That just gives me the direction. If you want to go to Columbia, go down 77. Go down 321. That's the way. Jesus said, you want to go to heaven? I'm the way. This is how to do it. What is my job as a pastor? It's not to fix your marriage. I can't. I can't fix it. It's not to fit, fix your financial problems, pay your light bill. My job is to point you to the way. I'm not the way. I'm just showing you the way. This is the way. Jesus is the way. If you're going to go to heaven, you've got to go through Jesus. He is the way. That is the direction. And my job is just to be a flashing sign going like this. I am this way, this way, this way. Come on, let's go this way, this way. And whenever, whenever we stop doing this and start trying to fix other things and do other things, we've lost our purpose because nothing can fix our problems if we don't know the way, and Jesus is the way. But it's not just the way in the sense of direction. He's also the way in the very means to get to heaven. He doesn't just show us the way. He is the very way, all right? And if I'm going to Columbia, I don't want you just to tell me, but just to go down 77. I want you to say, ride with me, and I'll take you down there. That is what I mean when I say Jesus is the means to heaven. He provides not just the direction, but he provides the very way for us. He gives us the means to get there. Do you want to go to heaven? Of course you do. You've got to go through Jesus. He paid the way for you. And if you think you can go any other way, you cannot because he is the way. No man comes to the Father but by him. A lot of people can point you to the way, but Jesus said, no, I am the way. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, I assume because you're here on a Sunday morning in a difficult time that you already know Jesus as the way. But if you do not this morning, if you're sitting here uncertain about where you'll go when you die, allow me to point you to the one who stood before us and said, I am the way. I am not just the direction. I am the very means to get there. What are you counting on to get in? What are you depending on? What's going to get you to heaven? To use my analogy going to Columbia, who are you riding with? Who's taking you down there? Do they know where they're going? Only Jesus knows where he's going. He's been there and come back to get us, and he is the very way. And then Philip makes this statement. Jesus, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. How many have used the word sufficeth in conversation this week? Just look across the room. One person. Okay. Strange, but I like it. All right. What does he mean when he says, show us the Father and it sufficeth us? It just means, show us God and we'll be satisfied. Why would he ask that? Because he was uncertain about who Jesus was. I mean, after all, Jesus was supposed to come set up his kingdom and now he's going to die. He's going to be betrayed. We're going to deny him. Is this the right guy? Is, show me the Father and I'll be satisfied. Jesus said, Philip, have I been so long with you? And you've never seen the Father? I am the Father. I am the truth, is what he says. I am the truth. He said, I am the one that you can believe in. Not just the one who tells you the truth. I am the personification of truth itself. I am truth. That's what he tells us. Now, if you look in John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus says this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. What does he mean by that? He means... You can believe me just as much as you can believe God. Now, if I said that to you, what would you do? Mm. Brother Dusty's on a trip. He's arrogant. Stay away from him because nobody's infallible. But why could Jesus say that? Why could he say he's as, just as believable as God? Because he is God in the flesh. John chapter 1 verse 14 tells us that Jesus came to this earth and he was full of grace and truth. He was the truth. He came to demonstrate to us what the truth is. As we look at these things, we understand that because Jesus is the truth, he reveals truth to us. 
What truth does Jesus give us? Well, he tells us the right way to go. He's the truth. He tells us the truth about who he is. He says, I'm God. And he tells us the truth about who we are in need of a Savior. And there's lots of opinions that you can get around this world, lots of places you can go. But if you want to know the truth, you've got to go see Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus was being crucified? He stood before Pilate and made a statement. And Pilate says this to him, what is truth? What is truth? You know, all the world's asking that question. What is the truth? Who has it? Jesus stands up in front of everybody and says, I am the truth. Believe in me. Now, I know there's some children present in the room, so I'm going to be careful about these statements. They're not inappropriate. I just don't want to crush any childhood dreams. Do you remember when you were little, you were told the story about a man who could see you when you were asleep and when you were awake, and he knew if you had been good, and he knew if you had been bad, and he kept a list of these things, and he rewarded you based upon your behavior. Do y'all remember that? I had a newsflash for you. It's not the truth. Crushing as it may be to some of y'all this morning, he's not real. But there's another man. And he does see you when you're sleeping. And he knows when you're awake. And he does keep track of whether you've been good or bad. And there are rewards and things based upon these things. But he's real. He is the truth. And if you're going to teach your children anything, Teach him about this one, because he never changes. Don't lie to him. Jesus is the one, and all gifts come from him. That's my Christmas message. I'm going to go ahead and write that down. Jesus is the truth. In a world that's desperate to know what, what reality is, in a world that has five million different opinions to choose from, isn't it good to be able to say, I know the great I am, and he is the truth. He's the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, and I am the truth. Now, let me ask you something. If I have the way to heaven, both the direction and the means, and I know the truth, and all of the uncertainty of the world, I have the truth, what do I have? I have the life. The life. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and he said, I am the life. What did he mean by that? What do you mean by life? Well, all of you are alive this morning to some degree. I mean, you got up and came this morning, so there's some evidence of life. And once you sat down, you got warm, you got comfortable, my monotone voice, I've just put you in that happy place. And you just got to hang on for about 15 more minutes, and you can come back to life again. But when Jesus says, I am the life, is he talking about physical life? Is he talking about spiritual life? Is he talking about eternal life? Let me remind you, he's talking about all three. He says, I am the life. Because if you're alive this morning physically, why are you alive? Because of Jesus, that's why. Yeah, you were laying in the bed this morning, and your alarm clock went off, and you woke up. You realize there were thousands of people who did not wake up, but you did. Why? Because Jesus is the source and the sustainer of physical life. John chapter 1 tells us that there is not a single thing made in the earth that Jesus didn't make. He made every single thing. John chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 tells us that for by him were all things created and by him all things consist. What does consist mean? It means not only does Jesus create everything, but he's the one that keeps it going. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that the Son upholds all things by the word of his power. All right? Why are you alive? Because of Jesus. These are easy questions. Why are you still alive this day? Because of Jesus. All right? If you live to be 100, why would you live that long? Because of Jesus. He is the creator and the sustainer of physical life. And some of y'all just need to get a little bit of an attitude of gratitude about the fact that there are lots of people in this world who are barely living who are not living, and here you sit in relatively good health, alive and well in York, South Carolina, and you forgot to thank the one who made it all possible. Because when your alarm went off and you complained about how early you had to get up, he gave you the breath to complain about it. And when you walked into your shower and turned, off the, turned on the hot water, 
to wash all that crustiness off so you could put your best face on and come to church this morning, it's because Jesus gave you the ability to do that. And the fact that you didn't have a tragic accident on the way here is because the Lord puts his angels and gives us charge over us, the book of Psalms says, and he protects us. And when you get to heaven and you can see all the things he's done for us, your mouth ought to just be filled with praise because Jesus is the life. He's created all things and he sustains all things. Let me just remind you that you can turn on the news anytime you want to and the world is always about to end. It's always about to end. If nothing else, global warming is going to destroy all of us. Let me just remind you that he made it and he sustains it. All right? I should be a good steward of the planet God gives me. I'm not for just dumping trash in the ocean. I believe we ought to take care of things. But this water is going to last just as long as God wants it to last. And if he wants global warming to destroy it, that's his business. But in the book of 2 Peter, the Bible does tell us that God is going to destroy the world with fervent heat. That means he's going to set it on fire and burn it up. That's the global warming I'm worried about. All the other stuff I'm not worried about because God is in control. So, Brother Dusty, they said on the news that we only have 20 more years left on the earth. You're the one buying all the toilet paper. Yeah, you're the one. Absolutely. Because if you want your heart to be troubled, you want your life to be full of fear and anxiety, just listen to what they say. But if you want to have some peace, learn who the life is, the one who created it and the one who sustains it, and he will carry us all our days. So, Brother Dusty, I might die tomorrow. You might, and if you do, it's because God designed it that way. He created you for his purpose, and then he was done with you, and he took you home. There's much more to what he has for us than, than this life. But if you live to be 100, it's because God allowed you to do so. And his kindness, his long-suffering, his grace and patience because he is the author and sustainer of physical life. But he's not only the author and sustainer of physical life. He's also the author and sustainer of spiritual life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you're here alive physically and you have Jesus on the inside, there's something inside of you that is alive spiritually. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's because you're on the outside looking in. You never experienced it. You're just watching us. And oftentimes people make fun of things they don't understand, so they make fun of us Christians because they don't understand that we got something on the inside they can't even begin to explain. But we do. You know what I'm talking about? It's that thing you cannot get away from, the thing that always drives you back to God. Even when you try to run away from God, the chain's only so long it stops and drags you all the way back. And even though you try to run from it, you can't run from it because it's on the inside. Am I the only one that has this? Me and John Pope, evidently, it's life that he gives us. It is a spiritual life. The Bible says we were dead in trespasses and sins, but you have he quickened. He made us alive, put something on the inside. Now, I, I can't always explain it, but I know I got it. I can't always put it in the right theological terms or even tell you how it all came about, but I know there's just something there. And when I open up this book, it burns inside me when I read it, and it speaks to my heart and it squeezes me until juice comes out. You know, it drips down on the page. Where'd that come from? That's just the life that he gives. And if you don't have it, then you need to learn who the way is and who the truth is and who the life is because Jesus gives that to us. And I've gotten the privilege to travel to other countries on mission trips, and I have met people that we did not speak the same language. Not at all. But instantly while I was around them, there was a kinship between our spirits because he had the same life on the inside that I had on the inside. And even though we couldn't communicate verbally, we could communicate spiritually. And even though I couldn't understand the songs they were singing, I was still worshiping because we had the same thing. It's the life on the inside. And I just ask you this morning, just because you're here doesn't mean you have it. Do you have the life? Do you have something inside? Have you met Jesus Christ and got beyond just the physical life where he has given you spiritual life? If you haven't, you need to learn who the way is, who the truth is, and who the life is. Because Jesus said, I came to fix your heart trouble. I came to satisfy those questions that you have about not just this life, but the next life. To satisfy you about how to get to heaven and about who I am. I am all of those things. Come to me. I'm the source of spiritual life. But thirdly, he's also the source of eternal life. 
See, that's what spiritual life is. It carries you on because you have a soul. You are a soul. Not just you just have one. You are one, and it lives in your body, and that soul will spend an eternity somewhere, and Jesus is the source of that eternal life. When I ask you, and you can talk to me here, what does eternal life mean? What does it mean? Living forever, okay? I have people tell me that all the time, living forever. Well, let me ask you something. While most people give that answer, I want you to think about it. There are two places you can go when you die. The Bible talks about heaven and a place called the lake of fire. It's a terrible place. I don't even like to talk about it, but it's in the Bible, all right? How many people in heaven live forever? All of them. How many people in the lake of fire live forever? And that's not what he meant. When he said, I give you eternal life, it means you'll live forever. Because everybody lives forever. Your soul will never die. It's where it lives that makes all the difference. And Jesus said in Romans 6.23 that we get the gift of eternal life through Christ and that he came to give us life and give us life more abundantly. Now, if I handed you a cup and I said, fill this up abundantly, at first you'd look at me weird because that's just not the terminology we normally use. But after you got over that, what would you do? You'd fill it up how full? Running over. Because abundantly means overflowing on all sides all the time. Jesus said, I came to give you that kind of life. And so we begin to understand that eternal life is not about quantity, living forever, but about quality. How many of you want to live forever just like you are right now, on and on? Nobody. Because perpetual existence is not really attractive. I don't want to be five foot five forever. I don't. We get to heaven, I want to be 6'4", and Matt be 5'5". Five five. I'll boss him around for all eternity. Just teasing. Nobody wants to live just like this forever. There's got to be more to it than that, right? Jesus said, I am the source of eternal life, abundant life, overflowing on all sides, all the time. That's what I give to my people. How many of you have that kind of life? If you have Jesus, you have it. Because he is the life, and he gives it to his people. You may not be appropriating it. You may not be living in it by faith. But he said, I came to give you a life that overflows on all sides all the time. I am that kind of life. And what is this world looking for? They're looking for abundant life. They're looking to find somebody whose heart is not troubled, whose heart is confident. They're looking for somebody who walks in the joy of the Lord and has the peace that passes all understanding. They're looking for somebody whose world is not falling apart, but it's overflowing on all sides all the time, and they got free, freely, the ability to freely give to anybody who's in need. That's who they're looking for. Do they find it in you? If you know Jesus, they can, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what he is. He never fails. He never lies. And he brings us to that point of abundant life. And I just ask you this morning, do you have it? If you don't have it, you need to meet the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Let me give you one more I am of Jesus. Jesus says, I am exclusive. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. What does he mean when he says that? He means that if you're going to go to heaven, there's only one way to go, and it's through me. What does that mean? It means that all those coexist bumper stickers on cars are stupid. Sorry for using the word. And if you have it on the back of your car, shame on you. It shows that you're not thinking clearly. And if I see it in the parking lot, I'm going to pull it off. So if you see me back there by your car scraping something, just give me a minute. It can't coexist. There has to be one way. Everybody can't be right. Everybody can't be right. And when the tenets of our religion are diametrically opposed to one another, both sides cannot be right. There has to be one standard for truth, and it is objective, not subjective, and it is the person of Jesus Christ himself. He said, I am the way. If you want to go, I will accept you. But if you reject me, then you cannot go. There is no other way. No man comes to the Father but by me. Brother Dusty, I don't like that. 
I didn't write it. I'm just telling you the rules. And the rules say, if this is where you want to go, Jesus is the way to get there. And if you reject that to find your own way, it will only end in your destruction. That's what he says. So if you're sitting here this morning and you don't know how to get to heaven, you don't know who Jesus is, you don't know what the truth is, you need to come and find your place before him and say, teach me that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Because I realize I cannot get to heaven without you. It is an exclusive thing. And all of us in this room, if we know Jesus Christ, are members of an exclusive group because we have the life living within us. So, but the entrance fee to the club has already been paid. All you have to do is accept the gift that's given. And he put the life inside of you. And you'll know with the same assurance that we know that we have found the answer to life itself. That's for the people in the room who are not believers. But let me speak to you believers as well about the exclusiveness of Jesus. The first part of the passage, how we began the whole sermon was this. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. What is Jesus saying? Don't be troubled. Believe me. Right? Say it in the negative. Let your heart be troubled. Don't believe me. That's what he's saying. Let your heart be troubled if you don't believe me. Can I say this? It's going to sting a little bit, but it's good for you. If your heart is full of worry, anxiety, and stress, it's because you don't believe him. It's because you don't believe him. Because if you do believe him, your heart's not troubled. When your heart is troubled, it's because you don't believe him. But you can stop not believing him and start believing him and give him all your trouble and allow the peace of God to rule and reign in your hearts this very moment. How close is it? Just as close as Jesus, the friend that sticketh closer than a brother, the friend who will never leave us nor forsake us, the one who is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is always here. And the minute I believe him, peace floods my heart. And the minute I stop believing him, worry, doubt, depression, and all of these things just overwhelm me, and I about drowned. Just like Peter, I lift up my hand and say, Lord, save me. And that faith leads me right back to that calm assurance that God's in control. And if the whole world ends based on the coronavirus, I'll see you all around the throne where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And if you think the worship was good this morning, just wait till we don't have anything to hinder us, where there's nothing else to leave for, we can stay for an eternity and just worship Jesus Christ on and on. And if that's not attractive to you, let me introduce you to the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, because he puts something in us that is only satisfied in worshiping and honoring him this morning. Do you know him? Do you know him? You can He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Is your heart full of trouble? It doesn't have to be. Believe in him because he's God and he has everything under control. Bow your heads with me. Father, Lord, we do thank you so much for the love that gave us hope. And Lord, I ask for every heart that's here this morning, every troubled heart, every difficult thing, that you would just speak your peace to them. That you'd grant them the faith to believe. And Lord, as they believe, they would have the peace that passes all understanding. And for those who are in the sound of my voice, Lord, who don't know you, who came here this morning for whatever the reason, Lord, that you would show them that you're the way, you're the truth, you're the life. When they put their trust and confidence in you exclusively. Remind you that our altars are open. You don't have to come down here necessarily. But if your heart's full of trouble and doubt and fear, give it to Jesus. Believe him this morning. And if you don't know the way, the truth, and the life, you don't know you go to heaven when you die. This is the day of salvation. He's present here this morning. If you need somebody to pray with you, if you're a man, I'll get a man to pray with you. If you're a woman, I'll